Tonight, I need to talk to you about the inner court and the outer court. I wonder whether you have ever experienced what I've experienced. And that is that I get a promise from the Lord and it never comes to pass. And you think, well, what on earth did God lie to me? Well, there's a reason why that happens. It could be the reason that the person that delivered the word is a false prophet, right? Or it could be that it's conditional. And I find that if you look through the scriptures, most of the prophecies are conditional. Even, even the prophecy about Jesus coming is conditional that he obeyed the Father. Now we know he would obviously obey the Father. But when you talk about your own prophecies or your own promises that God has given you, you need to understand that there are conditions required. They're they required to be met. So I want to start with two scriptures tonight. The first one is in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. Now therefore, if... Did you get that? If. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then 1 Kings 6 verse 12. Concerning this temple, now we're talking about Solomon building the temple uh, that, that God had in, instructed David to um, to get the plans for, etc. Concerning this temple, but in the day that we live in, there's a different temple. This temple. And believe it or not, you are building this temple because God lives in this temple. So, just keep that in mind. Concerning this temple which you are building, if, if you walk in my statutes, execute my judgments, keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will perform my promise with you which I spoke to your father David. So I want to talk about a temple tonight. There were three temples that we know about that were built. The first one was the Temple of Solomon. That one was destroyed and it was rebuilt some five, six hundred years later, I believe. And then during Jesus' time, the temple that stood at that, mo at that uh, time was built by Herod. This temple, however, Ezekiel's temple was never built. It is a temple that God gave Ezekiel a vision of. It's a temple that was built without hands. It's not made with hands. That does not mean it's less significant. And it does not mean it's less real. Because we're dealing with a spiritual temple here. And so I want to go through that a little bit tonight. Um, this is the layout of that temple that Ezekiel received this vision of. And there's basically four, four types of people that we deal with concerning this temple. Now, if you've studied the temple... You probably know more than me. It's not possible to share with you everything what is in the scriptures tonight. It would take us days, hours, weeks. 
So I just am making some highlights here tonight. So four types of people that we're going to talk about tonight. The first is the foreigner or the stranger. The second is the children of Israel. The third is the Levite. And the fourth is the priest. So let's talk about the foreigner first. Ezekiel 44 verse 9 says, Thus says the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart or uncircumcised in flesh, shall enter my sanctuary, including any foreigner who is among the children of Israel. So unless a foreigner or a stranger that was not a Jew had converted to Judaism, they were not allowed to participate in the worship at this temple. The next one I want to talk about is the Levite. And Ezekiel 44, uh, starting verse 10 says, And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear their iniquity. So what happened is people start to mix idolatry worship with Judaism or sometimes totally forsook Judaism and just worship pagan gods, even in the temple. Verse 11, Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary as gatekeepers. So this is after they repented, they come back to God. And God is saying, I will allow you to be a minister to, for me in my sanctuary. But it's as gatekeepers of the house and as ministers of the house. They shall slay the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people. They shall stand before them to minister to them. And then verse 13, and they shall not come near me to minister to me as priests, nor come near any of my holy things, nor into the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. Nevertheless, I will make them keep charge of the temple for all its work and for all that has been done to it. What I need to talk to you about tonight is the seriousness of sin. When God has entrusted to you to be a minister, excuse me, to be a minister, and you commit sin, yes, God will forgive you when you repent, but there are consequences that come with our disobedience. Because God needs to be able to trust you. See, I believe that there are times when ministers do things in the dark and in secret, believing that nobody knows about it. And they'll come back and they'll minister to the people. So understand this, when God endues a minister with a gift, it is irrevocable. That means God's not going to suddenly yank that gift away. I read uh, this week about a young man, I believe it was in England, and uh, he had two people in his life that made a great impact on him. One of them was an evangelist that would come to his little town. And when this evangelist came to town, the atmosphere got charged with the power of God. And people would repent. People would turn to the Lord. They would have salvations. They would have all kinds of things happen. What they did not know is that this minister had a lady that was not his wife follow him around. And he had an adulterous relationship with her. So just because God was using this minister in the gifting that he had given him, doesn't mean that God endorses his lifestyle. And so we need to understand that there's a responsibility upon us. We are on a Thursday night here. And I look at everybody here. You guys all mean business with God. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here on a Thursday night. So there's a responsibility that comes with God entrusting to you 
and giftings and abilities and entrusting to you people that you need to minister to. When you violate that, there is a consequence concerning your relationship with God. And so we're talking about the inner court and the outer court. So let's talk a little bit about the outer court. If you look at this plan here, this layout, the children of Israel would come into the outer court, but they would not be allowed to enter the, uh, the inner court. They would have to remain in that outer court. And these Levites that I just talked about, they would go out and minister to the people in the outer court. Now, they were, the, those Levites that had repented are allowed to come into the inner court to do, this, make, do, to do this sacrifice. But the people were to remain in the outer court. It talks about an intimate relationship, that there are different levels concerning your relationship with God. God desires for you to come into the inner sanctuary but he, he will not violate his own standard to accommodate you. And so unless you come to that place where you truly come and say, Lord, I give my all to you, you're never going to experience that intimate relationship that you so long for. You know, I've come into the presence of people that have paid it all. And it's amazing. It's amazing the presence that those people have around themselves, the presence of God. It's like there's an, a special anointing that they carry. And it costs them something. So unless you're willing to take that extra step, you're going to be on the outskirts of God's presence. You're going to experience His presence. You're going to experience the outpouring of His forgiveness. You're going to experience the giftings that come with that. You're going to experience feeling that presence of the Lord. But you're not going to be in that inner circle. Now, James talks sometimes about the bride of Christ. And you need to understand, at the wedding feast of the Lamb, there's going to be guests, but there's also going to be a bride. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the two disciples. The mother came to Jesus and said, I want you to grant my two sons one to sit on your left and one to sit on your right. See, that's reserved, not for everybody. It's reserved for those that he chooses. Who will he choose? See, when I, when I proposed to my wife, I chose her. I didn't choose somebody that was, dis was distant from me. No, I chose her because we had spent time together. We had gotten to know each other. And we had gotten to a place where we felt oneness with each other, we were comfortable with each other's company. So Deuteronomy 7 verse 6 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord. The Lord God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. And he's talking about the children of Israel. But yet, they were to remain in the outer court. So, James chapter 4, verse 8 says this, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
when I married Rhonda, my wife, she didn't, it wasn't an on today and off tomorrow. I, uh, you know, like the pedal. I love you, I love you not. I love you, I love you not. You know? No. It was a commitment. It was a commitment. Then we move on to the inner court. And in the inner court is those priests and Levites that did not stray away when everybody else did. You know, when everybody else follows a fad, it's easy to do the same. But it takes a special person to stand their ground and say, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to remain in what God has called me to do. So Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 15 and 16 says, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary. They shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. They overcame. When everybody went their own way, these chose to stick with the Lord. And they overcame against all odds. They overcame. And as a result of that, see, there, there's a price to pay. It's a process. When I give my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ today, and troubles come, and temptations come, and I want, I'm drawn this way, and I'm drawn that way, there's a time when I have to determine in my heart what am I going to do? I believe that God's desire for each one of us is to have a pure and a holy life. That means that there are certain things that you cannot do. There are certain things that you want to do and you'd like to do. Your flesh wants it. But you choose Rather, to be a pure and holy before the Lord. So what happens if you failed? The Lord looks at the heart. Do you remember the story about uh, Samuel? When God sent him to anoint the king to take Saul's place. And he went to Jesse, and Jesse brought all his sons. And there were some really qualified guys in there. But none of them were chosen. And then, in the end, you know the story, David was chosen. And what did God say? He says, man looks at the outside appearance, but God looks at the heart. See, we do fail. But God looks at the heart. Uh, I, I had somebody call me up the other day, and it's a minister, and uh, it's, it's my daughter. She's a, a worship, used to be a worship leader, and she's part of a church. And the pastor is called a 40-day fast. And she said, Dad, I don't want to do this, man. And she said, is it going to be really sinful if I, if I don't participate in this 40-day fast? And this is what I said to her. I said, well, it depends on your heart. I said, you could agree to do the 40-day fast, but in your heart, you are rebelling. Even though you're doing it on the outside, you're rebelling on the inside. That is sin. Not doing the fast is not sinful. But the heart is what God looks at. Are you refusing to do the fast because you are in rebellion? Are you doing the fast under duress 
that you really hate it and you really don't want to do it? See, God looks at the heart. And when we make a mistake, God looks at the intent of the heart. When we talk about these Levites earlier on that followed, followed idol worship, it's not a one-time occurrence. But it was a pre-planned worship that they wanted, that they participated in. And that's why there was a lasting consequence. But when you do something in the spur of the moment and you confess your sin and you say, Lord, I'm sorry, God looks at the heart and he looks at your intent and he will restore you fully in the place that you were before. So we come to 1 Peter chapter 2 and says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, we read that earlier in the Old Testament, right? And there was a condition. Now we're reading it in the New Testament. And God is making a proclamation that when he looks at your heart, he chose you to be his priest, his royal priesthood. So we move to the holy place. What, what this is a picture of is every step is a closer relationship with the Lord. The outer court, you experience the Lord, you experience His presence, you experience His forgiveness, you experience the giftings that come with it. But that intimacy that you desire is just not there. Then you move into the inner court, and now you are at the place where the sacrifices are happening. You experience and you get that revelation, the, the amazing power of the blood of Jesus Christ that forgives your sins. And thirdly, we move into the holy place. And so Leviticus chapter 10 says, And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Do you, do you, maybe, you, maybe I didn't explain myself here, but are you getting the severity of what's going on here? There is a holiness that comes with intima, intimacy. There comes a lack of pride. Because when you start to give God all the glory, you are diminished and He is raised up. And so as we get closer and closer to the Lord, this is a picture of the holy place. This is the place where you are so close to the Lord that you hear Him and He hears you. You talk with Him and He talks with you. Now understand what I'm saying. We all hear God from time to time. But this is different. This is where you are so close to the Lord that you're on a one-on-one. -on -one. You just, it's like your, your sensitivity to His presence is, is there all the time. See, God's presence is not cheap. It doesn't come just because you attended church five times a week. It doesn't come because you prayed for somebody and they got healed. God's presence comes when, remember Psalm 91? He who dwells in the secret place, right? Shall be under the shadow of the Almighty. That's where it starts to happen. When nobody knows. 
I was at a service this past Sunday, and uh, the presence of God was amazingly uh, powerful in that place. And I've been at that church several times, and it's not very normal for people to just voluntarily went, go up front. But the presence of God was so strong that several people went up front. Some would dance. Some would just stand in awe before the Lord. Some fell on their knees. I saw this one lady just fell on her knees, and after a while she couldn't even stay on her knees, and she was laying down by the altar. It wasn't, a sh it wasn't something showy, but it was something intimate that was taking place. There's a price to pay to get to that place where people don't know what you do in your inner chamber. Instead of doing things that you think people don't know and you, you know they're wrong, you're in this place and you spend the time alone with the Lord. From there we move to the holy the most holy place. This is where God dwells. This is where the mercy seat is. This is where the covenant of God is ratified. This is where the fire of God is present. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says now, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The one who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, I saw a picture the other day of somebody that loves the Lord. And they were on the beach somewhere. And I could not look at that picture because it was not glorifying to God. When you truly come to the Holy of Holies, you cannot flaunt whatever you feel like doing. There is a seriousness when it comes to that holy place. God's presence is never cheap. And so you may say, well, am I working myself up to this place? Is it because of works? I have to do certain things to get there. No. It is a relationship. The more time you spend alone with the Lord, the greater that intimacy happens. So 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? God desires to establish His home in you. So, I want to close here shortly with three points. So you can count them off. Point one, point two. There is good news here. The first good news point is this. Remember in the beginning I talked about strangers and foreigners that were not allowed to even come into the outer court? Ephesians 2 verse 19 says this, Now therefore you are no longer strangers. You are no longer foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You've been redeemed. You've been grafted in. I came to this nation 28 years ago I married an American lady. She drugged me here. <laughs> no. 
But I wasn't a citizen here. I was a foreigner. Yeah, I went through the motions that most Americans do. I got a job. And I paid Social Security. And I paid taxes. But when it really comes down to it, I was not part of this nation because I was not a citizen. But when I went through the motions and I passed the test and I paid the price, I was given a piece of paper that said, now you are part of us. And so when we go through that place where we pay a price and we seek the Lord, and as tests and tribulations and temptations come, we choose God instead of those things. Then the day will come. It says, you are no longer a foreigner. You're no longer a stranger. But you are a part of the household of God. The second good news is this. When we talk about the temple, sacrifices were made. Blood had to be shed for our sin. Where did that start? It started, by the way, with Adam and Eve. When they sinned and the fig leaf didn't do the job. And God gave them a covering of an animal skin. Well, where did that animal skin come from? An animal had to die to cover their sin. And so that's where it started. And so from there on, it was a law that blood had to be shed for our wrongdoing. And so Hebrews chapter 9 says this, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God. Cleanse your conscience. He will cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then the final good news is this. See, there is no more outer court or inner court there is free access to whoever will. Because when Jesus died, the veil was torn. But you cannot defile this temple. If you want to be close to God, you draw near to Him and do not defile His holy presence. God bless you.